ask you to open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. want us to read 1 Corinthians chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. Now concerning things sacrificed to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. If anyone supposes that he knows anything, he is not yet known as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by him. Therefore, concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols, we know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world, and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through him. However, not all men have this knowledge, but some, being accustomed to the idol until now, eat food as if it were sacrificed to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. But food will not commend us to God. We are neither the worse if we do not eat, nor the better if we do eat. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone sees you, who have knowledge, dining in an idol's temple, will not his conscience, if he is weak, be strengthened to eat things sacrificed to idols? For though your knowledge, for though for through your knowledge, He who is weak is ruined, the brother for whose sake Christ died. And so, by sinning against the brethren and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. Paul began... The letter with Christ as the foundation in everything, especially for the church. And as he moves through this letter, he begins to deal with specific sins in the church. If Christ is who he is, then there is sin against God because we are in need of Christ to save us from the debt and the guilt of our sin. And as we consider who Christ is, we want to consider him rightly. And that also means we want to consider what sin is and to consider it rightly. As he moves from these issues of sin, he begins answering questions given to him by the church in 1 Corinthians 7.1. Those were issues such as the issues of marriage, divorce, or singleness. In answering questions, he reminded them that all of the Christian life needs an eternal perspective. He continued that thinking when considering another matter from the church, which was liberty of conscience versus what is sinful behavior. Now, he already addressed some liberty issues in the previous chapter, but the specific matter in chapter 8-1 is foods served to idols. I want you to note here in chapter 8-1, he says, Now concerning things sacrificed to idols. This starts off exactly almost like chapter 7, doesn't it? If you'll turn back to 7-1 and just look briefly to remind yourself, Now concerning the things about which you wrote. See, he's had this question come up to him. Is it good for a man uh, not to touch a woman? And now concerning things sacrificed to idols in chapter 8 verse 1. Now the whole of the chapter brings up a question and also brings up an argument that's taking place in the Corinthian church. That argument is simply stated in this way. Some were saying that God commanded us not to worship idols and that foods offered to those idols were a part of the worship. 
So as the food was used in the worship of the idols, it was condemned. Not only was it condemned, but to eat of the food was a sin in and of itself. So this is the question about these foods sacrificed to idols. What are they actually? And the argument became, some were saying, they're nothing. They're just foods. It's just meat. Uh, it means nothing. And others were saying, no, it was sacrificed to idols. So because the food was used in the worship of an idol, then the food itself is condemned. And therefore, to eat of that food in any way is sin. Well, this apparently had gone on quite a while in the church at Corinth. And they had gone back and forth enough about it that at some point in writing to Paul sending Paul these questions, this is one of the questions they brought up. Well, I want you to note first this morning, Paul spoke of a knowledge possessed by believers. Paul spoke of a knowledge possessed by believers. This knowledge is concerning that there is only one true God. Now it's interesting here, he starts off dealing with knowledge and saying, you know what, don't be arrogant with your knowledge. He says, love edifies. And then he comes to this knowledge and says, what is it that we exactly know? What's the first place we start with our knowledge? All knowledge has the best starting point when it points to we know God is the only one true God. See, that's the real issue in all of life, isn't it? He wrote to the church in Rome. What? The problem with these people is they won't bow the knee to God and call Him God, and so therefore they live their whole life suppressing the truth that was made evident to them and in them. And Paul says, this is the starting point. The knowledge that we must have and we must start in every place thinking is that there is only one true God. Verse 4. So he states the truth of God's one essence in verse 4. And he further states that God is revealed as Father and Son in verse 6. He says there is but one God. Verse 4. He says the one God, the Father... From whom there is all things, we exist for him. And then there's the one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things and we exist through him. This is the starting point of our knowledge. We need to keep that first and foremost in everything that we do. And some will say, well, yeah, but what about the Holy Spirit? Well, remember back in chapter 2, he had written about the Holy Spirit plainly. So he's Trinitarian in his theology from start to finish. It's just here in this particular place, he's reminding them uh, the Spirit's already in play because the Spirit is necessary for you to have any understanding of what God is doing anyway. And I've already stated that previously, that without the Spirit, you wouldn't have any understanding of what God is doing, period. The Spirit is revealing the truth of God's Word to you. The Spirit is what is revealing the truth of your own sin to you. The Spirit is the one that is regenerating your dead souls and enabling you to understand who God is in your salvation. So in his Trinitarian theology, he brings forth a context to say we have knowledge and it's important knowledge. That knowledge in and of itself is important to us in every sense of what we do. Whatever is going to be said about Christian liberty starts in understanding who God is. Understanding who He is, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Whatever freedom we may have in Christ begins with our understanding of who God is. So Paul spoke of a knowledge possessed by believers. Now you also recognize what he's doing here is he's saying to the church at Corinth, if you don't start with this, then the question is, are you acting like believers? Or have you decided to do your own thing your own way? You have to start with this foundation to answer any question about what it is I do or do not do. It's very easy for us as humans to 
uh, have our own forms of working out our own morality. And we always want to ask the question of what's right. We're kind of, we, we live in that all the time if, if we're not recognizing what's happening in the world. You have battles going on in the whole of the culture about what's right versus uh, what's wrong. Is it right to have a man fight a woman in a boxing ring? Is that not a morality question? And the world is saying well, we love everybody, so it's okay to have a man beat a woman's head in and to do it under the guise of boxing when normally that person would be arrested for, uh, you know, uh, spousal abuse or something. See, these are morality questions. We're, we're all the time in the world confronted with these things. And Paul says we have to have the right knowledge before us and Christians are the ones that have that and that foundational knowledge is in the one living true God and Him alone through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, what does that knowledge lead us to? Well, second, secondly, Paul reasoned there is no such thing as an idol. Paul spoke of a knowledge possessed by believers, and Paul reasoned there is no such thing as an idol. As there is only one true God, how could idols have any real effect on the physical earth or the souls of men? I want you to think about that for a second and take that in. There's only one true living God. He is spirit, and he alone will be worshipped in spirit and in truth. He is one and true and real. So whatever can be fashioned by the hands and minds of humans to be worshipped in any way is an idol, but an idol in and of itself is not a god, and it can do or, nor accomplish anything. Even if someone worships the human will, you can have such a view of free will in a culture that you actually worship the human will, and you can say, we can be and do anything we want to do if we put our mind and our will to it. You ever heard anything like that? I, I think if you've kind of grown up in the America that we live in, you've heard that all the time. doesn't take away the importance of personal responsibility. That's all the more important. Yet at the same time, the recognition is I can do a lot of things in my own will, but ultimately, whose will am I under? Whatever I may accomplish, Elon Musk has accomplished being a billionaire and owning this and that and making rockets and doing whatever and saying whatever he wants to, and yet he still is not bowing the knee to the one true living God to realize he's done all of that in his own personal will, but God himself is sovereign over everything Elon Musk has ever done. He wouldn't have SpaceX if it weren't for God Almighty allowing him to A, have the mind that he has, and B, to have ordered before time began that that would be worked out that way. Bill Gates would not have uh, invented Microsoft the way he did unless God himself sovereignly had ordered it to be so. Bill Gates was sovereignly ordered to be who Bill Gates is. And whatever his mind and will did as an individual, it was truly his mind and will then, that did it. And yet at the same time, it's all under the sovereignty of the one true living God. So even if we fashion an idol with our mind, and that idol is our own human will, it truly cannot be worshipped as God because in and of itself it does not accomplish all things. Only God accomplishes all things. So Paul can say, there's really no such thing as an idol that is an actual God that can be worshipped that does anything. He says very plainly, for even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, 
as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God. And in him moves, he moves all things. They exist in him and of him and through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So if your place of question and concern is about things given to idols, then recognize the idol itself is nothing. Now you do need to recognize here for all of the importance of the language that Paul gives about grace to the weaker brother from Romans 14 and 15 and the grace he talks about here to the weaker brother in, uh, in 1 Corinthians 8, you do recognize here that he's also trying to teach the weaker brother. That's an important element of the context of dealing with these things. Is It's not simply Paul saying those who have knowledge need to throw their knowledge away and never use it. He's saying, yes, the weaker brother needs to learn and grow too, and yet at the same time, the grace needs to happen between both parties. Why? Well, the weaker brother has to understand there's no idol that is a god. There's just nothing there. This meat is just meat. This food is just food offered to something that is not God. Now, why does that become important? Because what do you do when you worship an idol? You actually think worshiping that idol is going to bring something about into existence in your life that will move and change life. That's why you worship it. Read historically about the gods of the ages and the different nations. And every time the different nations had a god, they expected when they worshipped that god or offered something to that god, whatever that god's name was, and we see evidence of that in the Old Testament, Baal, the Asherah, the different gods that are brought up there in their context, what were they trying to do? They were trying to say to Baal, Baal, you live in actuality, and you move and you do this thing by all for us. But see, by all didn't actually exist. That was a figment of the imagination of the suppressing, rebellious, human, sinful mind. It didn't matter how they made Baal. If Baal was made out of wood or stone or gold... The golden calf, did it actually do anything? No. If they wanted to take a food and, and offer it to that idol, what did it actually mean? It ought to give us a little bit of sense that after they offered the food to the idol, the food was still there. And then the food could be eaten by humans. This is what men do in their rebelliousness. They invent things to worship instead of bowing before the one true living God. And then in doing so, they take the things around them and offer it to those things they invented. And those things actually mean nothing in the context of worship or bringing anything to existence. The Egyptians had all types of issues over time because uh, the pharaohs, after a while, had become gods in and of themselves, and they would offer sacrifices unto the pharaohs. But what would happen is they offered sacrifices unto the pharaohs, and they treated Pharaoh as the god. There came a time when everything in the nation of Egypt may not be going that well, and they would say, Pharaoh, you're our God, but you're not changing this. So what would often happen to a Pharaoh? They might end up dead. What kind of God was he if you could kill him? Paul is saying to both sides of the issue, 
There is but one God, one living and true God only. There is no such thing as an idol that does anything. It accomplishes nothing. And even something that is offered to it accomplishes nothing. So when he deals with this, he says, Therefore, the meat or any object used in an offering to an idol is not the issue. The issue is not to worship the idol as it is not real. And certainly not a God because there is only one true living God. So you see what Paul is going back to here? He's going back to the commandments. And he's saying, first and foremost, for both sides of you, let's make sure we're thinking rightly. What has God commanded us? You shall have no other gods before me. So if that's not your starting point, then you both err. And even the weaker brother, you err because you're not understanding. This meat does nothing. This meat in and of itself is not even the idol. But even if it were an idol, it does nothing. I don't know this to have been the concern or the question, but thinking through some of this, what if one of the Corinthian believers had worshipped some idol that had been carved out of wood? They knew no longer to worship that idol. But that piece of wood had cost quite a bit of money and it was useful in some way and they decided to use that piece of wood as a leg for a table in their house. Maybe they had several of them and to have the table they used several of those idols as legs for this table that they would eat on. Did that mean that they were worshiping that idol every time they sat at the table? No, they had just repurposed that wooden thing because they recognized it was no longer an idol. Now there might have been somebody with a weaker conscience who may have come in and said, you can't do that, you should have burned that piece of wood and never used it. Paul is saying, it doesn't matter. It's nothing. It's nothing. So Paul was trying to help the weaker brother to grow, to strengthen them, to recognize. There's no reason to condemn something and call it sin when the scripture does not explicitly condemn it and call it sin. Well, third, Paul contrasted knowledge with arrogance and knowledge with love. First, Paul spoke of a knowledge possessed by believers. Second, Paul reasoned there is no such thing as an idol. And third, Paul contrasted knowledge with arrogance and knowledge with love. Notice, Paul did not say that their knowledge was not important. He doesn't take the idea of knowledge and throw it away. And we have some of that in Christianity today, right? Where people are saying, we don't really need to know anything, we just need to feel it. And in an essence, really, that's kind of what the weaker brother is doing is in their own conscience, they're feeling something and they're feeling it to the point that they're saying it needs to be condemned because it, it's weighty on my conscience. So it must need to be condemned for everybody. Instead of saying, no, the scripture gives us knowledge and that knowledge tells us what needs to be condemned and not condemned. So Paul's not doing away with knowledge and saying, live by your feelings. He's not saying knowledge is not important. He instructed them to take their knowledge of God, idols, and meat sacrifice to idols, and apply them according to Scripture. And furthermore, not only to apply them according to Scripture, but to apply them with love towards one another. He's really dealing with a lot of the 
human mind in the context of how we live because we get certain convictions in our minds and those convictions become issues that if someone doesn't agree with us on it, then we have to separate from them. Paul is seeing that happen in the church here in Corinth. There's a separation going on inside the church. There's a a rift that's coming inside the church. And some are saying, if you eat that meat of that idol, you're in sin because you ate that meat. Not only is that idol condemned, but that Meat is condemned, and therefore the eating of that meat is condemned, and therefore when you eat of it, you ought to be condemned. And others are saying, no, no, wait a second. That's not right. It's nothing. It's just actually food is all it is. In and of itself, it's nothing. Well, how are they going to deal with this? He says, well, they have to learn to apply their knowledge without arrogance and apply it with love. The one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, well, now that's a non-negotiable. See, they have to have knowledge of who God is, and Paul says that's where our knowledge begins. If one group was saying, there's five gods... And one group was saying there's one God. Well, now, wait a second. That's a different issue, isn't it? That's dealing with non-negotiables. If one group was saying Jesus is not co-equal with the Father in essence, that Jesus is not the Son of God in deity, and the other group was saying that he is, well, now, that's different. If one group was saying we could worship many gods and one group was saying we are commanded only to worship the one true living God, well, now that is a different story. So we see there are elements that are non-negotiable. And those elements that are non-negotiable, they should spark Christians to go after the truth. But even those things that are non-negotiable should not spark us to sinful anger and animosity towards one another. Now there's a place for the idea of righteous anger when someone were to stand and preach in front of a church something that is just completely heretical and filled with all kinds of errors, we can have a righteous anger at that. But even that in and of itself, we have to be careful because left to ourselves, it's very hard for us to have an anger that's purely righteous, isn't it? As elders, we're called the the three of us to protect the flock and shepherd the flock. There's times we see things going on out in the wider Christian community as to false teaching that gets our ire up to say it nicely. There's times we express real, real, real genuine frustration about the things that are being taught among churches across the world and in our own land. But if that goes to a place of sinful anger and animosity toward others, then Paul is giving us a grave warning here and a grave caution. I may have a right to speak very, very plainly about truth. But the gospel doesn't give me a right to go around screaming and yelling at people with a blood-red face. You don't know the truth. You're going to hell. 
I don't really see Paul acting in a manner like that when he's leading as an apostle. I don't see that in the Lord Jesus. There's very direct language. He doesn't mince words. It's pretty plain what he was saying. But I don't think we see him, even in the, the type of frustration that, that Peter exhibited with cutting the ear off of the soldier. What's Jesus doing? <laughs> Peter, put the sword up. Here, let me see your ear. We have to be really, really careful with our knowledge. Because our knowledge can puff us up and bring us to pride and arrogance. And then we walk in that pride and that arrogance of our knowledge. And we begin to put that knowledge out towards others in an arrogant way. You know, one of the things we learn as we walk in this human experience is nobody really likes a know-it-all. Doesn't even matter if I'm a know-it-all. As a know-it-all, I don't like another person to be a know-it-all and be a know-it-all to me. We, we just, we hate that, don't we? You're just sitting at a table with somebody and you make a statement and then they correct your statement and they give you a whole bunch of other information and they just continue to do it all the time. And they do it every time you're around them and they're just going to tell you everything they know all the time. And after a while, what do you go? That's a know-it-all. I'm really tired. And what do you start to do? You start to avoid the know-it-all because you don't want to have to hear that all the time. Paul is giving a great caution to some of these brothers in the Corinthian church. Are you being gracious with the weaker brother? Or are you being a know-it-all? Has your knowledge led you to a place of arrogance where you're going to prove come hell or high water how right you are about this food offered to idols? And you're just going to shove it in their face all the time and prove it to them and show them what you know? He's giving them caution. There are non-negotiables. But even in dealing with non-negotiables, we should not be sparked to sinful anger and animosity toward one another. Being that there are non-negotiables, and we could make a whole list of them, there's lots of things that are non-negotiable in the Scripture. Paul's already dealt with some non-negotiables in the church in Corinth, hadn't he, with dealing with some of the sexual sin, right? He's already said, this is a non-negotiable. What this man is doing with his father's wife, that's got to be dealt with. That's a non-negotiable. Fornication, homosexuality, adultery, all these things, these are non-negotiables. This needs to be dealt with. He, he didn't mince words on that. But then he says there are some negotiables. The meat sacrificed to idols is negotiable. As a matter of fact, the discussion of it should spark edification and gospel-centered grace toward one another in Christian liberty. Fine. Brothers who have a better understanding of this issue, of this meat offered to idols, fine. That's fine. You've got some knowledge there. The question is, how are you going to lead your weaker brother? Weaker brother, can you understand that you have a responsibility to grow just as this other person has a responsibility to grow? Can you listen to what they're saying and it not become a fuss and a fight? He brings us to a place to understand that our knowledge left to itself becoming the end and the means makes us arrogant. When knowledge is the end and the means, it makes us arrogant. If you're only growing in your knowledge to have knowledge, to make yourself look smarter or more understandable or whatever it may be, whatever the purpose of that is in your world, if the knowledge is the end and the means, then it will make you arrogant. If the knowledge is based in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ because he is all in all, 
then that knowledge, rightly rooted in the person and work of Christ, will lead to edification. And that edification will lead to love. I think we have to admit sometimes we find it hard to love some people. But we whisk that idea away as Christians sometimes to say, well, they're just too hard to deal with. Now, there are certain times that situations come to a place that something has to be dealt with because it has come up in just real sin. And that's the way the church ends up in disciplined situations is ultimately some sin has become so prevalent and unrepentant that it has to be dealt with. And you're loving the person because you're dealing with the sin. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about an issue of Christian liberty. Can I recognize that my brother can have a place of conscience that might be stronger in their own mind? And I don't have to press them on it? I was speaking to a person some time ago. A gentleman said to me that he couldn't buy things online because he never knew if those things he was buying online, if, if they had come from stolen property. And he was convinced that he just was not going to buy things online, especially because there's just no way to know. And I, I thought to myself, okay, that's interesting. And I mean, he was adamant. And I thought about that. Oh, okay. Well, that's, that's interesting. I mean, I don't want to buy stolen property because I'm, then I'm encouraging the person to steal, right? So I don't want to just keep doing that. And yet at the same time, I don't have a knowledge that something's stolen. Well, you know what? I said something to this brother about, hey, you may not always have knowledge if something's stolen or not. You can't always just say, I'm not going to buy anything online because it, it's probably stolen. I mean, we'd never buy anything if that was the case because everything we buy is pretty much tied to something that we would have difficulty with, especially as Christians. He was not allowing for any liberty. But yet I also recognized in the moment, I don't think this is a place to stand and try to talk to this brother at this point because he's so convinced of his position, all I'm going to do is end up in an argument. And he's going to be really mad. And you know what? I might be really mad too. So why would I even start it? There's a time to walk away. Even in our Christian liberty in the context of it, there's a time that it's okay to walk away. Let the person have whatever it is that they think is so important to their conscience. And if they think it's binding to their conscience and it's somehow helping them before God, then sometimes you leave them to it. This is why the local church becomes so important in proper teaching. is because the local church is supposed to be the one through its teaching to bring people to see there's a context for things and a proper understanding of it. Most of the time I find Christians with all kinds of confusion who either go to a church that is not solid or they're not going to church at all. I may beg the question whether they're a Christian or not, but that's another issue. There is a time in our Christian liberty to look at someone and say, you know what, I don't think I'll have this fight today. It's okay. You say, now Brandon, why would you bring that up? I say, think about it. There are times when we get a hold of so much knowledge that that knowledge becomes so important to us that we have a hard time deciphering how important it really is and then we begin to make sure that everybody knows exactly what we know and those become areas that we want to dig in, dig our heels in and stand our ground and say, ah, 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 ah. Well, if you do that with every piece of knowledge you have, you're never going to be at peace with anybody, and the Scripture calls us to be at peace with one another. A fighting spirit 
is not a Christian spirit, especially in the church. It brings us to a place to understand these things. First, there is liberty not to eat foods. Let your brother not eat the foods. It's okay sometimes. There's liberty. Some people just have liberty there and some people don't. It's okay. There is liberty not to eat foods. I don't eat mayonnaise. Many of you know that. Uh, I find it vile and I really see no reason for its existence. Uh, I would think the world actually would be a better place without it. It's a personal preference. It's a liberty. Some of you love mayonnaise. You love it so much it oozes out of your sandwich when you eat it. It drips everywhere and you eat it by the soup spoonful. My dad was that way. Maybe that what hap- that's what happened to me. There's liberty not to eat foods. There's liberty not to deal with certain things. If you don't want to have a glass of wine, don't have one. Don't have one. If you don't want to buy things online, don't buy them. Don't buy them. There's that liberty. There is that liberty. But Paul wants to give us a sense that if one's conscience is bound against meat offered to idols, then recognize your misunderstanding of your liberty in Christ. Idols are not real. So meat offered to them is nothing but meat. God is real and has already provided the sacrificial offering of His Son, the Lord Jesus. And that is all that matters. Now I know I'm being silly a little bit, but if you eat mayonnaise, and I don't, that matters nothing in the scheme of the gospel. You, know, you realize there are some of us, I won't... I won't name everybody in here because I don't know it to be true, but there's some of us, we, I have a tendency, we worship food. I'm a stress eater. If things get stressful, I just want to eat whatever's in sight. Some of you have known that about me for years. Food can be an idol. It, it can be a drug. It can be an addiction. A bag of potato chips just make me feel good sometimes. I just walk away and say, man, I feel good. My stomach doesn't feel all good, but I feel good. That dozen, dozen donuts was good. It just made me feel better. I got a sugar high and I'm going down as we speak. But <laughs> You see, there's things in our lives we don't recognize they really are idols. It doesn't, doesn't make a donut sinful. The donut in and of itself is not sinful. The potato chip in and of itself is not sinful. The fruit of the vine in and of itself is not sinful or the Lord Jesus wouldn't have turned water into wine. Why would the Lord Jesus have done something sinful? And it was true wine. And the scripture says that it got stronger. These are difficulties for us. But if you've got a brother that doesn't want to do those things or a sister that doesn't want to do those things, it's okay. Okay. But also, those who don't want to eat, remember, you not eating that thing or or partaking of that thing does nothing before God in Christ. He's not going to bring you into his kingdom today, uh, one day, because you didn't eat or drink of that thing. Are there specific sins? Yes, gluttony is a sin. If I'm making food an idol, gluttony is a sin. To worship the food over giving my issues to the Lord and trusting in Him. If I trust in that bag of potato chips and make that my place. If strong drink becomes the place that when things are difficult, I'm going to go to the strong drink and make my life better because I'll forget everything. But the scripture doesn't say... Not partaking makes you better before God. 
No, if you're accepted before God, you are accepted before God in Christ Jesus alone and nothing else. If one's conscience is bound against meat offered to idols, recognize your weakness and do not be demanding of others. Paul stated in verse 8, but food will not commend us to God. We are neither the worse if we do not eat, nor the better if we do. Colossians 2.16, therefore no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. There are people that don't celebrate certain holidays, and some people that do. I've known people that didn't want to celebrate particular holidays. Well, holidays are not in the scripture laid out in a calendar. They're just not. Are there reasons that some of those holidays can be good and useful, and we can appreciate them even as Christians? Yes, amen. But it doesn't mean everybody has to celebrate it or celebrate it the way we do. You do realize there are some people in our southern communities that show up for an Easter service one time a year and they think they've done their duty before God. If you think an Easter service is what God commended and commanded, then you're wrong. He commanded your whole heart in repentance and faith that you would worship him one day out of seven. If one's conscience is bound against meat offered to idols, then please don't eat or touch. If your conscience is still bound, Paul says, hey, look, if you bind your own conscience in this way, you'll be in sin, so don't eat. But even though you've chosen not to eat, don't put it on your brothers and sisters that they have to do everything you said they have to do. That's like all these ideas in churches where, you know, there's this particular diet. You know, some years ago they had the Jesus diet, fish and something. And if you were really going to be a true, really serious Christian, you were going to come to this Bible study and you were going to read the Bible and study this and then y'all were going to eat fish together. Or whatever it was their little plan was. That's just going back to the old sacrificial system and ceremonial laws. That's plus Christ. You can have all kind of debates about bacon and fried food and whether it's really good for us or not. I've met many a person that never ate a fried food and you know what? They still died. I'm not saying you have to be a glutton with fried food, right? Do you worship your fried food? I don't know what's in your heart. Remember these things. Remember, Scripture gives explicit commands not to worship any idols or any other gods. That's the important thing. Scripture gives explicit commands not to worship any idols or any other gods. If you have an idol in your heart then you need to repent of that and you need to give it over to the Lord. And I don't know what that idol may be. If that idol is strong drink and you are a drunkard, then you need to give it over to the Lord. If drugs have taken you into all kinds of places, you need to give it over to the Lord. If pornography has sucked you in and sex is your idol, then you need to repent and give it over to the Lord. There's no liberty in pornography. The scripture does not give us that liberty. That is a mental form of adultery. So we need to look for the explicit commands. Remember, scripture does not explicitly command against eating of foods offered to idols. Certain things it just doesn't command. And we need to be okay with that. Whether we choose to partake of it or not, we need to be okay with that. Don't put onto your brother something. And on the other side, if you're okay with your liberty, don't force your liberty on everybody else. If you invite a brother and sister over for dinner and you know that they don't uh, want to have certain foods or they don't want to drink certain drinks, well, don't have it out on the table and shove it in their face. 
I may have a glass of wine, but it's not my job to have four bottles of wine sitting in your face while you're at my table if for some reason you're bothered by that. On the other hand, please don't perceive me to be less of a Christian and less of a person in Christ because I may have a glass of wine. But if you do, it's okay. The reason you need to think less of me, though, is because there's a lot worse sins in my life, and that's not one of them. I got all kind of heart issues just like you do. You know, in reality, what this comes down to is where you place your trust. Is your trust in the Lord, or is your trust in the things you do or do not do? Do you trust that Christ saved you from the debt and the guilt of your sin? Are you trusting that your salvation is going forward? I never sin again. Well, then you've misunderstood the gospel. Because you will sin again. The question is, will you be a repenting repenter? We have to recognize there is liberty to eat foods. And a reminder from the Colossians. But we don't have a liberty to be arrogant with our knowledge of our liberty. Remember, anger, animosity, distrust, and disrespect are not proper responses regarding matters of Christian liberty. Remember, anger, animosity, distrust, and disrespect are not proper responses regarding matters of Christian liberty. If I have a brother who will not partake of a certain thing, I have no right If it's inside of liberty, I have no right to look at my brother and say, you just got something wrong with you because you won't do that. That's taking my knowledge and being arrogant. That's taking my knowledge and being arrogant. True knowledge of God in Christ tempers a desire to boast in my liberty alone. If we make, even for the person on the other side, if I make my liberty alone the place of my boasting, then my boasting is no longer in Christ. And Paul said you boast in Christ alone. My boasting is not that I can eat fried foods and I'm still going to die anyway. Everybody's going to die, so just eat all the fried food you want. Eat fried okra by the poundfuls. And I would. And brother, if you won't eat as much fried food as I do, then you just don't understand liberty in Christ. That brother might be saying, you know what, I understand. I understand the liberty not to have a heart attack. Or not to have a second one. Hey, I don't have a right to be arrogant with my knowledge. Is there a place to teach and understand Christian liberty? Certainly, and we need to do it in the church. But Paul's wanting us to see, you know what? Don't get angry with one another. Don't have animosity with one another. Don't distrust one another. Don't disrespect one another over issues of liberty. The questions come about in the non-negotiables, not the negotiables. All of this is based on the grace of Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it leads us to ask the question, am I going to live in the fruit of the Spirit? Because the fruit of the Spirit is not animosity and anger toward my brother because they don't agree with me with liberty. The fruit of the Spirit is love. Love edifies. You can have all the knowledge you want in the world. Remember Paul arguing and we're going to get there? You can have all the knowledge. You can have all the special gifts. You can speak in tongues. You can speak in the languages of angels all you want to. But if you have not love... Faith, hope, and love. If you have not love, you have nothing. One writer says, The central problem of our age is not liberalism or modernism, nor the old Roman Catholicism or the new Roman Catholicism, nor the threat of communism, nor even the threat of rationalism and the monolithic consensus which surrounds us. Nor would I add today, postmodernism or materialistic consumerism or visceral sensualism or whatever. All these are dangerous, but not a primary threat. The real problem is this the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, individually or corporately, 
tending to do the Lord's work in the power of the flesh rather than in the spirit. The central problem is always in the midst of the people of God, not in the circumstances surrounding them. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we give thanks for the church at Corinth that in the midst of their difficulties, you sent your word to them through your Apostle Paul to answer their questions and their concerns. And Lord, we ask for ourselves that we be mindful, that we learn and grow in these things, that we would love one another in the difficulties of this life, that we would genuinely grow together as a body of Christ. Lord, help us not to get ahead of ourselves with our own knowledge and become prideful and arrogant in our own knowledge and to look down on our brothers and sisters. Lord, if there are any with a weaker conscience on certain matters of, of any kind, will you help them not to look down on those who don't hold their views? The matter is, will we stand in the truth of God's word recognizing your plain commands versus places of liberty? And will we love one another through it? All glory and honor be to you through your son, the Lord Jesus. Amen.